to go back with me to Matthew chapter 3. So you've got your fingers there, keep them there, we're going to get, get you to the Do you remember the experience of Nicodemus? He came to Jesus one night. And um, he came in darkness because he didn't really want the people to see that he was ignorant. You know, he was one that people looked up to, that they were people that, he was the type of person that everybody considered as having the information as what one should do in order to be saved. But he came to Jesus and he was still trying to figure out everything. He wanted to get this news first. And it's amazing that when Jesus was speaking with him, he didn't even stick to the questions that Nicodemus asked him. But it said to him that in order to be saved, you had to be born of water and the Spirit. Do you remember that? And this was kind of uh, not new to Nicodemus, but he couldn't fully understand it and somehow tried to play it down. You know, he, he asked the question, how is it possible for me to enter back into my mother's womb? You know, how is that possible that an old person can do that? The idea is that's a really a good question. As, as, as weird as it might have sounded, it's a good question. And the reason why it was a good question is that some of us feel that when we get to a certain point in our lives that we're beyond change. That we're beyond rebirth. But nobody's beyond rebirth. It's true we might have different ages now, but every single one of us, as we are seated here, is in that position where we can actually experience being born again. Now, Jesus makes it very clear that in order for us to get into the kingdom of God, we have to be born again. So if you have not experienced this born again experience, I've got a concern on my heart for you then. Because the probability is that you will not see the kingdom of God. So what is this new being born again really all about? And it's not really, as Nicodemus was trying to assume, going back and starting again. You know, how many of us wish that we could go back somehow in a time machine to when we were a bit younger so we could make better choices? You know, I've, I've watched some of these documentaries where they show you how the people can go back in time, which is, you know, something that I don't think will really happen. But I'm always intrigued by these documentaries because the interesting thing is, like, imagine me now, I'm going back in time. And I'm now at this age, I'm a, a senior member now. I've got a, a pension card. But I climb into this time machine, and I want to go back to somewhere in my life that I made a few mistakes. Now, you know, they talk about this ripple, they call it the butterfly effect, that if you change something that happens when you were there, it's going to have a ripple effect all the way through. You know all about that, isn't it true? So somehow, I wouldn't even be standing here if I changed something there. That's what they're worried about. So first of all, I'm not really interested in going back to change something there. I'll explain it now, but imagine that I could do that. I could go back and change something there. The change that I make is going to have an impact right throughout my, my then going to be life. Do you understand? It's, it's not just going to be ending up with me all of a sudden in a better place than what I was, just because I made a change there. Those changes could affect me in anywhere along the line to maybe not even be here to make a decision to go back. Do you understand? But I want you to imagine for a moment that I could go back there and I get back there. What is the problem when I get back there? Straight away. What is the problem? Well, it's not that I'm too old for my time, but you, you close it. What is the problem? It's true, there's not cell phones there and they might not have the fancy stuff that we have now, but what's the problem? You see, when I get back to that place, I'm going to be meeting myself. And when I meet myself, that, that self is the young self of me. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And so when meeting him there, I'm not really changing that me, I'm changing that person. Do you understand? Because the only way to change that person is that I shouldn't make the change already. I can't 
change it from here. Do you understand that? I can't go back in time and change something because by changing that, I'm changing my future. And I love that. I like that very much. Because if that could be done, we could have taken Adam back to the Garden of Eden, we could have gotten hold of Eve, and we could have slowed her down and said, no, hang on, don't do that. But then what would immediately happen? Would I be standing in the pulpit here? No, everything we know as we know it will not be there anymore. Christ would not die on the cross of Calvary. There wouldn't be any of this stuff that we know if we change something in the past. So the past can't be changed. As they say, it's water that's gone underneath the bridge. You can't change it. Dear friends, and that's something we have to ex accept. But you can be born again. You can start this life from now on as you wish it could have been if it was there. Do you understand? <laughs> anywhere along your journey, anywhere, I don't care what age you are, anywhere along your journey when you all of a sudden feel unhappy with a decision that you made that's causing a ripple effect onto you now, you can now, at this very moment, change that course. Do you understand that? You can be born again. <coughs> and the Bible teaches me that God introduces this for a purpose. And we have a baptismal font, and the reason why we baptize by immersion is that as we like to portray it, it's like actually dying to what you were, and when you come out of the water, according to Scripture, you are a new creature in Christ. Do you understand that? All things are past, behold, all things are made new. That's what you can do, and you don't need to go back in a time machine to change that. You can do it by baptism. Now, some of you might have been baptized already, and you've gone along your journey in this new journey, but along this new journey, you find to your horror that some of the things that you actually did do before you were baptized, you got yourself doing. Have you experienced that? Where you've been baptized and you're a new creature. You know how many times people come to me and they say to me, Billy, is it possible I can be baptized again? Well, yes, if you really want to, but there is another ordinance that God has introduced to actually replace when you get when you get your feet dirty. Do you understand? When you go into this baptismal font, it's actually declaring to the world that I am a new creature. I'm not the same, but it doesn't mean that this new creature is not going to make mistakes. But there is one thing in your mindset that is different. Up to this point of baptism in water, up to this point you were double-minded, you served different gods. But when you go into the baptismal font, you've made a decision, and what was that decision? I choose to serve the Creator God. You understand? There can be many others, but I choose. It's like marriage. You could have been involved with a lot of men or women. You could have been courting and getting on and all that. But one day, you make a decision. And that decision is, from now on, this person I choose to spend the rest of my life with this person I wish to change everything I am and, and accommodate this person. That's what you do when it comes to baptism. Baptism is, is saying to the world, up to now I've been with my one foot in the world and my one foot on planet earth or in, in heaven, but I've changed my mind. I, I, I want to serve God only. Do you understand? And this is like that declaration. This is like that time when we stand in front of the minister as married people and we make a vow. And we agree until death do us part. We will remain faithful to our commitment. Now, dear friends, along the journey, sometimes you wish you could change your mind. But I praise God 
that God hasn't left room for you to change your mind. There is nothing else you can do after being baptized. If you've been baptized, you can't return back and be baptized. No, then, then somehow the baptism lost its significance. It's like marriage. You can't, you, you can't change it. You're stuck. <laughs> but I want to make this clear to you. There's something that God has allowed. Did this say you got married and somehow it wasn't the match made or the marriage made in heaven or whatever? You know, somehow you found out about this person thinks that you didn't know. Because you know the amazing thing about marriage is we always put our best foot forward when we when we caught it. My wife found out to a great to a great disappointment that I don't snore. No, she has to you know, elbow me and say, hey! Well, okay, I don't really hear any of that. I just roll over. And guess what happened when I roll over? I stop snoring. And she's happy with that. And we get along. I, I wonder sometimes when I wake, when I wake up, I've got bruises. But, <laughs> and I want you to understand something about baptism. Along the journey, God is going to elbow you. You're snoring. Roll over. Why? Why is he doing that? He could easily get up and walk away and say, I don't want any of this, but he doesn't. He's willing to accept you with all your quirks. And you know the most amazing thing out of all is this. You are going to wish <laughs> you could go back in time, even after your baptism. The difference is lots of us here. I was baptized 46, 47 years ago. And there were many times when I say to God, oh man, you know, I didn't know this. I need to be re-baptized. <laughs> no, you know what God has introduced to, to replace that? Is the foot washing. And how often do we wash one another's feet? At least every three months. Do you know that that is a miniature baptism? In actual fact, Christ said to Peter, when he said, Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. He said, uh-uh, that you get a baptism. But the part that got dirty now was your feet. Do you see, Christ has made the communion a way in which we can bring those things that we've fallen in and confess them, just like we did here at Bethlehem, and say, Lord, be merciful to us. Let your blood come up on us. Let us eat your bread again. Let us walk away from this point clean. You know, the most amazing thing about the communion service is actually fulfills the promise, where the word says that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Foot washing and the communion service is basically that inaction. God is forgiving you and cleansing you and making you ready and available to start the journey as if it's brand new. But you know, there's one major difference. There's one thing that you haven't changed your mind in. You've perhaps changed your mind in the way in which you've behaved. You know, you don't like that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. And you're changing that. But there's one decision that you don't change and that is your change to remain faithful to Christ. Did you hear me? There are things that we in a marriage relationship do, we will change. I'm not the same person that my wife met and got married to. And actually, she successfully changed me. I'm not the same. You know, my wife actually said to me one day, you're not the same person I met. So I said, yes, you've changed me. What I'm trying to bring out here is that along your journey with Christ, you will change. You get older, you think differently, you don't behave like a child anymore. When you were a child, you did childly things, but when you get older, you do old people things. You understand? But the choice that hasn't changed is I still want to be with my wife. Did you understand that? And baptism isn't something that has to be repeated. Baptism is where you've made that commitment to belong to God. That from now on, though you slay me, I serve you. Do you understand? You choose. How many of you, as 
and their pictures have been dead. Wow, there's a lot that happened. Mm, I'd like to talk with you. Okay, if you don't want to talk with me, talk to Paul. Or talk to Gerald. Or talk to somebody, but you need to talk to us because you need to be born again. Do you understand? But I want you to understand this. Being born again doesn't mean that all sudden things are different. There's only one thing that is different, and that is that you've made a choice to follow somebody in particular. And I want to warn you that the devil will do everything in his power to get you off of that. Do you remember how the, the devil came to Peter? Jesus actually warned Peter. He said, Peter, the devil wants to sift you like we. And Peter said, Lord, no, they're all forsaken all of you. You know, he was actually trying to say, but we would like to try to say. But just a little while later, he, he cursed God. And he ran off. And he was in the, in the garden, you can see me crying because he realized that he wasn't honorable to his commitment. You know, Jesus, when Jesus met Peter, he said to Peter, follow me. Do you remember that? And Peter dropped everything he had and he followed Jesus. It's interesting, dear friends, that Christians are people who follow Jesus. That's why we are called Christians. If you are a Christian, but you're a person who's following Muhammad, or you're following whatever, then you can't call yourself Christian. Do you understand? A Christian is a person who has chosen to follow Christ. Now, if your lifestyle is not in accordance with that, you need to get refocused. Because he is the one. Now, Peter lost focus. He was afraid. In the garden, he was afraid. He was scared for his life. You are in love, not in. You are in, you're not in love. And he's swearing. But because the Christians don't swear. And swearing was a way which we proved that we don't belong to God. And then Christ caught his eye. He looked at Peter and he said to Peter, when you sin, Peter, I want you to know I'm praying for you. And at that moment when Peter cursed God and he looked up, Christ looked at him. You know, the most amazing thing is that Christ hadn't forgotten the, the agreement. He, hadn't, he didn't look at Peter and say, oh no, man, look what you did, Peter. You messed everything up. Because, you know, Peter had done a lot of incredibly interesting things for Christ. He even walked on water. I mean, goodness gracious me, that is something that I haven't even been able to do for Christ yet. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Peter revealed in his life that he really did believe in Christ, but in some moment he just lost it. See, in some moment he let his hand go. And what did he learn in the story of walking on the water? That the waves are going to come and they are going to separate you from Christ. And in that moment you are going to sing. But please, never forget to look up and you will find that there is a hand extended to you. Picking you up and walking with you back into the boat. Do you understand that? Christians are going to fall. Guaranteed. But it doesn't change the journey. Don't allow it to change your journey. Terrible things happen in marriage, and some people allow those things to change the journey. God has to fix that. No, you started this journey with God hanging there. The Bible says, He that endures to the end it is He that will be saved. When I see people who have been married for such a long time, Man alive, they need a special medal. But it's a medal that they can only get. Because nobody can give it to them. Because they haven't achieved that. So baptism is the beginning. Baptism is all, and I want you to notice something. In the Word of God, we just read there, John says, well actually in John chapter 1, John says, I baptize with water. Now, I want you in some way just to replace the word John and you're going to hear these words. Billy is baptizing with water. Did you hear that? Now in the story of Jesus, the interesting thing about Jesus is that he never once baptized with water. Did you hear that? 
Never in his whole life did he ever baptize with water. His disciples did, but he didn't. And I was intrigued by this, you know, because I want you to understand something. I'm, I'm John the Baptist. I'm Vinnie the Baptist. I'm going to be baptizing you, but there's nothing about me. There's nothing in me that's magical that's going to change you. Because you need to be baptized with water, which I will do, but that doesn't change you. But you need to also be baptized by what? By the Spirit. Because it is the Spirit that changes. Now, the interesting thing that John told me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming after me, of whom I cannot even loosen his sandals. He's coming after me, but he's not going to baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with what? You see, it is Christ, dear friends, that you genuinely need after this baptism. Because I do what I call a symbolized baptism. My baptism is what John's baptism called. My baptism, the water baptism, is called a baptism of repentance. Do you hear that? And the word <coughs> repentance in the Greek is what? You all know it by now. It's metanoia. It's the Greek word metanoia. And the word in the Greek word means you have changed your thinking. All I'm doing when I baptize you is I acknowledge, because you see, I've met with the candidates that have been baptized, and I've found out from them that they've chosen to follow Christ. What I'm doing by baptizing them is acknowledging to you as the witnesses that these people have chosen to follow Christ. But I want you to understand something very carefully here, dear friends. It doesn't mean they're perfect yet. But they are going to be. You know, John says, What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what you are. But we don't know what that means. But the only time we'll know what that means is when Christ comes in the clouds of heaven to fetch us, because then John says, We will know him because we will be like him. <coughs> you see, from this Experience. You don't realize it in your life from baptism of water to the time that Christ comes in the clouds of heaven, you have been changed into that nature by the power of the Spirit of God. I indeed baptize you with water, but one who is going to come after me in this experience is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? I do want to tell you this, I'm going to be doing some presentations on this very concept of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I do think it's important for us to understand, we sometimes confuse things. But at this time, I want to invite the candidates to come to the front who are going to be baptized. Will you please come forward? And we to go step forward. And I'm asking Gerald, he's on his way. I want Gerald and uh, just to bring you to the front. We're not uh, welcoming them yet because what hasn't happened yet? They haven't been baptized yet, but we are. I want you to stand over there. I want you to look at everybody. And I want them to look at you. What is the problem with this picture in front? Ladies, what is the problem with this picture in front? No men! No men! Yeah, friends. <laughs> I want you to understand something. Baptism is not just for women. Do you understand that? Baptism is also for men. You also need to be born again. Not just the woman. But it's wonderful for me. I've met with them. I've managed to, to remember their names. And uh, I'm going to introduce their names just from here. The first one is Kim. Now, I don't know if any of you know Jerome. He talks a lot. You know, he's very cool. Do any of you know Jerome? Well, Jerome, please stand. Okay, this is Jerome. And I want you to know something about Jerome. He didn't go and tell people outside of the church about how much he loves Jesus. He actually told his own family. And they've chosen to follow Jerome's footsteps. And so Kim, she's a good wife. She's chosen to follow Jerome. And then they have a daughter. Her name is Jade, like in um, stone. She's a, 
She's one that loves to talk just like her dad. She loves talking about scripture. She, I mean, if I want you to read scripture, she's the first one to, to, to be willing. And I know that sometimes some of the words that you have to speak out are difficult, but she tries and she gets it right. That's Jade, and she's made a decision, which is wonderful. But then Jade has a friend that she influenced. Now, it's strange, but not only did Jerome influence his family, but Jerome influenced the family that I'm introducing. Now, the sister, sorry, the, the daughter of Jerome, the daughter of Jerome and Kim, Jade, she's friends with her friend, Keisha. Is that right, Keisha? Keisha and, and, and Jade are friends. And um, they decided to get baptized together. Wow. Now, the most amazing thing about this all is that the next person I'm going to introduce is Jane. Jane is Keisha's mother. Wow. Do you see that? And so we had families, and then of course, Alison. Um, I got to know Alison because she's asked and requested baptism. Now, this crazy part about it all, I didn't have any influence in her being baptized. But do you know that there was somebody who had an influence in her making the decision for baptism? And I'm going to ask you if you will stand, please. It's her friend. Can you just give your name to them, please? Yeah. Neil. Like in Neil. You know when you kneel? <laughs> Neil. And she, he's introduced her to this fellowship of believers, and she, she just loves to be with us. She's also gone through this whole process, but has chosen to be baptized in our church today. So, Alison, welcome. Okay? But you're not, we haven't done, there's no introduction that there are members yet. They've still got to go through the watery grave. And then they will become part of our family. As I, as I mentioned to you, this is, um, Jay is a friend of, sorry, uh, this is Keisha is a friend of Jay. And it's wonderful for me to, I've invited them both to come into the water because they want to start this journey together. And they know how cold this water is. <laughs> and I want to ask you something. Before I baptize you, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Um, have you decided that you want to follow him with everything you see? Or will you remember that even though you fall sometimes, that you can get up and ask him to forgive you and that you will forgive him. And then you're going to follow him again. Carry on following him. Okay, so do you believe that Jesus died for you, that he rose from the grave for you, and that he's now in heaven pleading for you? Do you know that? Oh, that's good. Now, on the strength of the witness, I will testify.
down Keisha's mother. Jane, I'm so glad that she's coming in. You know, she said something to me when we were talking. She said, you know how old I am? <laughs> I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but she said that she's discovered the truth in this church. Amen. And that the, tu the truth has set her free. Amen. <laughs> Now, Jane, I know that it's a long journey that you've already walked up to now, and that it's only in the last while that you've actually got to go through this country. And you, you are excited about it. And you want to know more. You want to know everything Jesus has to say in that tree. And you've decided to follow him. And you want to be with him one day. And you want your family to be with you. You do. So we must pray for a family, for everybody. So at this time, as again authority has been given to me, I now baptize Jane <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank <laughs> you. 